Well, thank you, and uh, it's great to be here, and I'm very thankful to be part of this event today and uh, all that TMAI is doing. As it was mentioned, I am now working at Grace Community Church, and that's a privilege for me. I grew up at Grace Community Church. Uh, six months old, I started going there. I just found the expository preaching was something I wanted to sit under as a six-month-old and the other. No, I thank the Lord that my parents brought us to Grace Church, of course. Uh, very grateful to be there, grow up there, and never really thought about missions before, uh, before God put that on my heart. My wife and I ended up going to China for a few years uh, before being asked to come back and take the position that I have now at Grace Community Church, which is Minister of Missionary Care and Development. So that's a pretty long title. And from my experience, uh, usually the longer your title is, the less important you are. So um, I think that's probably correct. And, uh, but I've been back at Grace Community Church for two years now, and it's been great to be there to help train our missionaries and to help connect our church to our missionaries. So those are the, really the two largest elements of my job, is both the pre-field training and caring for them when they return off the field, and then the, getting our church connected to our missionaries. And I imagine that's what a lot of you are involved in, getting your church connected to your missionaries. How do you make sure that missions are, is something that excites your church members, where they're praying for your missionaries? How do you get them um, excited for what God's doing overseas? By you being here today, I can pretty much guess that you're excited about what God's doing overseas. Uh, I don't need to get you excited about it because you wouldn't be here otherwise. But uh, to get, how do you get the rest of your church involved in that? And so that's what I wanna talk about a bit today. I'm gonna talk in a few minutes about a, some biblical principles. We'll look at a few passages briefly, just a biblical foundation, uh, but then we'll spend a lot of time on Practically, what does that look like? What are different things that our church can do to encourage and support missionaries? But before I do that, um, being a missionary at one time, and obviously talking with our missionaries a lot, uh, I have found that there are certain things you can do when a missionary's in town that will drive them crazy. Uh, so I want to share those with you. You've probably done these before. I know I have done a few of these before. And, uh, but something to think about. So just as a way as introduction, I'd share a few of these. I, I borrow a number of these from a website, uh, how to drive ex expats crazy, but uh, they have particular application to missionaries. One way is the first time you see a missionary at church, say, hey, good to see you, when are you leaving? <laughs> I can't tell you how many times that was the first question I was asked when I got in town. Hi, when are you leaving? And I know it was not because they were, well, I'm hoping it's because they were not trying to get rid of me, but um, they're just wanting to kind of know what's the status, what's going on. But uh, as a missionary, that's not really the first thing you want to hear. Um, instead, tell them that you're happy to see them. Invite them over to dinner. Instead of saying, when are you leaving? Say, oh, it's so good to see you. Hey, well, I'd love to get together with you if you have the time. So something to do as an alternative. The next thing we want to drive them crazy is mock the language that they're studying in that country. It's hilarious for the missionary because they've only heard it about 30 times. So if they've been serving in China, you can go up to them, oh, hi, hey, China, ching chong, ching chong. <laughs> and as a missionary, you oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. Very funny, it's cracking me up right now. So yeah. Uh, Probably avoid that. Instead, ask them about their experience of language learning. Ask your missionary, what are the challenges you've had? Ask them, do you have any funny stories that have happened to you in your language learning? And believe me, every missionary has a couple stories of when they've blown it language-wise. Um, and we certainly did a number of times in China. It, uh, it can be very challenging. A third way is to make fun of the country that they live in. Uh, missionaries love it when you do that. Um, so I come back from China and they joke, oh, you better hide the dog or else, you know, Rodney's going to cook it up. That's what they eat there, you know. Ah, yeah. Uh, 
Instead of doing that, maybe just ask questions about their country. What interesting things have you found out about their country? Um, try not to mock the country that they're from. I know, again, it's lighthearted. No ill intent is done when people do that. Uh, they're just trying to make fun, have fun, have conversation. But uh, believe me, your missionaries have heard that one before. Uh, they can do without it. Next, drive them crazy by lumping in their country with, with all the other countries in that region. Um, I was asked once uh, when I came back, hey, if you really want to get to know the culture, you should see this movie, Last Samurai. It's, it's really good. <laughs> well, that's, that's Japan, not really China. Oh, yeah, yeah, same thing. It's, it's, you know, it's pretty much the same. Asian, right? Yeah, a little different. Um, or I've heard stories of people come back from, say, Burundi or somewhere in Africa. Oh, have you learned African yet? Can you speak African? <laughs> no, it's uh, not African. There's a lot of languages. So instead of that, obviously, um, ask questions. Know your missionaries. Get to know them. Know exactly where they're ministering. Read their newsletters so you know what to ask. And if you're stuck and you see a missionary at church and you forget the country or the language, just ask questions. You can't go wrong just asking questions. Um, and that way you're not dumbing down the situation and they don't know how to respond. Next, drive them crazy is you oversimplify their experience. A missionary comes back after, oh, say, you know, four years, five years. Uh, they've been serving in France, a difficult situation. And you go, hey, so you haven't been here for four years. How was that? How was that? It, it, okay, let me summarize these last four years in two sentences for you so you can understand about the trials of ministry, the, the sadness, the, the joys that we've had, the people we have seen grow. Uh, many times people expect you to, yeah, just spit out in two sentences what their experience was. So instead of doing that to a missionary, ask specific questions. How was the food where you were? How was the traffic where you were? How was the living conditions? Be a bit more specific and then really listen and uh, hear what they have to say. Next, you can drive them crazy by comparing their experience with your own. Missionary comes back serving in South America for eight years and you say, hey, oh wow, that does some tough. Well, I was on STM in Mexico once for a week and I can't tell, oh, it was horrible. Let me tell you how bad it was. And here's someone telling the missionary, topping whatever story they want to tell with their own because their STM experience. Um, I think missionaries are generally good natured about that. And oh, okay, that's, that's, uh, that's real interesting. Thanks, that's, that's good to hear. But uh, in general, instead of doing that, don't top their stories, just listen to the stories, ask more questions. And finally, a way to, probably the, the best way to drive your missionary crazy when he's on furlough is just ignore him. Uh, do you feel a little awkward? You don't know exactly what to say. And so just kind of ignore him, pretend that they're not there. And um, that's really a way to discourage your missionary. Um, obviously, these are all things that I would encourage you not to do. These are things that are done all the time. Um, and again, probably not from bad intentions ever, but, uh, but it's very easy to fall into these traps. And if you talk to missionaries, ask them, have you ever experienced one or more of these? I'm pretty sure they'll tell you, oh yes, yeah, I remember that. Uh, I remember that happening. Um, so approach them, ask questions, listen. It really comes down to loving them more than you love yourself more than you love to tell your own stories, really listening and caring for them. So I just do that by way of introduction. Uh, let me first just share with you a couple principles, uh, actually four principles uh, from scripture about the sending of missionaries, about the caring for missionaries. Because I think we want to recognize that everything we do needs to be grounded from God's word. And we see examples in God's word in the narrative portions of scripture and we see instruction from God's word in the epistles and other places that we really need uh, to look at closely. So let me pray for us real quick and then we'll look at some of these biblical principles. 
Father, we thank you that you care enough for the world that you sent your son. You love the world that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sin. Lord, the love that you shown to us is so great. Lord, we need to be willing to go ourselves, be willing to send people, to be involved and participate in the work of the ministry, to see people come to be worshipers of you. Lord, as we talk about a few principles and how practically that might look, Lord, may you be honored in that. Lord, may it uh, just help churches to support their missionaries, to send more missionaries. Lord, that uh, when we stand together in heaven one day, as Revelation tells us, with people from every tribe, nation, and tongue, we may be filled with joy at that experience because we were part of the task um, that you gave us to make that happen. And we thank you for the privilege we have of being involved in evangelism and missions. That is a work of your grace, and we thank you for it. I pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. So again, just a few biblical principles uh, I want to touch on first before some practical ideas for you. First, we see missionaries uh, were sent from a local church. Uh, that's what we see in the book of Acts. In fact, the first missionaries in Acts 13, we see that happening. So verses 1 to 3 says, Now there were in Antioch, in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So we see early church, early stage of the church, the modeling of what it looks like to send out missionaries. And we see here, first of all, who was sent out to the field. When it talks about the church here in verse 1 of chapter 13, it says there were the prophets and teachers, and included in that list of prophets and teachers were Barnabas and Saul. They were among the leaders of the church. And it's, I think, instructive for us. As we read the book of Acts, we know it's narrative, and we need to be careful hermeneutically when we take any narrative portion of scripture and see that as a command. Uh, we need to be very careful of that. At the same time, we know the Holy Spirit used the author Luke to write down certain details for the benefit of us today, for the benefit of the, of the church. And the Holy Spirit had Luke write down details for a reason. And I believe the reason that he wrote this is to be a model for us, to be instructive for us. And as we see this model and what Luke mentions here is that this church in Antioch sending out which, who would I believe the greatest missionary ever, the Apostle Paul, he was selected from among their prophets and teachers. And so what we can see here is the early church in Antioch, they sent one of two of their best men. They didn't choose that teenager who was willing to go. They wanted to send their best men out. These were qualified men. Now you can see they were qualified to be leaders of the church. And that made them qualified to go out as missionaries as well. Every missionary that you send out should, ha should be a qualified person, should be qualified to be a leader of the church. And we know what leadership qualification is in scripture, don't we? It's elder qualification. If you're sending out someone from your church that you would never put in a leadership position in your church, there are serious concerns about that. And I think that is not following our example in Scripture at all. What people are sent when they go out to serve as missionaries is to strengthen or to plant churches in some way to see churches built overseas. Well, if they would not be qualified to lead in your church at home, how are they going to do that? What kind of problems might you be replicating overseas? if you send someone who has character issues or is not strong in God's word. 
So we see that they're qualified men from this example here in Acts 13. We also can see that they've been involved in the church. These were churchmen. These were men who were involved in teaching, were involved in leadership. And by that, because they're there then been serving in the church, they have that experience when they go out. And I think that's the same thing we look at when we're sending out missionaries. I know from our church, when we send out a missionary, has he been serving in the church? Has he been faithful? I had a man come to me a while ago and finished seminary and said, I have, I finished my degree, I have the knowledge, I'm ready to go out. And I said, oh, great, How, where have you been serving? Who, who do you know? What pastor are you under? He goes, well, I haven't been able to really serve in the church while I've been in seminary. Um, been having to work, don't have, haven't had time for that. And as excited as he was to serve, I, I let him know gracefully, look, come back to me after you've served in the church for a while. Go ahead and, and get involved. Have opportunities to serve, to counsel, to teach. And then come back because I want you demonstrated to me that you have served in the church and that you're willing to serve in the church. And so we see these men here, certainly Barnabas and Saul had been serving in the church, had been leaders of the church. And then I think the other, the other thing I want you to notice here is says that how they were sent out is fascinating to me. While these men were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. The Holy Spirit was the one who said, these are the men and they need to go. Now, what did that look like exactly? Was that a, a loud voice? What did that look like? Well, the passage doesn't tell us. And I think we need to be careful not to read something into scripture that's not there. Now, I believe in the first verse, it says there were prophets and teachers. Well, them having prophets at that time, the Holy Spirit may have spoken through one of those prophets to say this. But we don't know for sure what it looked like. But we do know this. Number one, it's the Holy Spirit's work that God sends out. And if you were able to hear Brad Clausen's message earlier, God commissions men to be sent out. He commissions people. But what, what I want you to notice in this passage is the Holy Spirit use the leaders of the local church to send out these men. This passage could have easily said, or, you know, scripture uh, could have been written, and the Holy Spirit said, I am sending out Paul and Barnabas. I am sending them out. Release them. But he doesn't. He gave the instruction to the leaders of the church to send them out. And the leaders of the church, after they fasted and prayed, they did that. They did send them out. And so we see here this example of God working through the leaders of the local church to send someone. So as part of Grace Community Church and GMI, which is Grace Ministries International, the uh, missionary sending uh, organization connected to Grace Community Church, or actually part of Grace Community Church, everyone must have a sending church that goes out from us. Usually it's Grace Community Church, but occasionally it's a TMS graduate who's from another sending church, but they have to be from a sending church. Who is the one who wants to send you out? Because I want to know that they've evaluated your character and they've evaluated your ministry over years and they can say, this is a faithful man. So this is the example we see here in Acts 13, one that we should follow. A second biblical principle is missionaries remained connected to the local church. And we see this in Acts 14, after Saul and Barnabas went out, they had come back. And it says, from there they sailed to Antioch, from which they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had accomplished. When they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a long time with the disciples. At the end of uh, Paul and Barnabas' ministry, they came back to their sending church. They came back and reported all that had happened there. And they spent a long time sharing with them. Now certainly, this shows us the church wanted them there. They allowed them to spend a long time and hear from them. And so again, we see this connection. The missionaries stayed connected to their sending church. 
And it was not, okay, we're, we're handing you off to a missions agency and uh, maybe we'll see you again in a while. They stayed connected and they were always praying for them and happy to see them when they came back. Another principle we see really throughout the book of Philippians is how the missionaries had communication with their supporting church. So the Philippian church was a supporting church. They didn't send out Paul and Barnabas, but they did aid them. And we see their aid talked about here in Philippians chapter 4, 15 to 18. He says, you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. So here we see a supporting church, the Philippian church, in Paul's ministry. And he thanks them. He mentions... Uh, how grateful he is for their financial contribution to his ministry. Even Epaphroditus was, a, in a sense, a short-termer who came to be with Paul and encourage him as well. So this is one example in the Philippian church, how they gave. We can see uh, other communication Paul had with them throughout the book of Philippians. If you have your Bible, you can look there at Philippians 1, verse 3. Paul expresses thankfulness to the Philippian church for their prayer. Philippians 1.3 says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. I encourage missionaries, let them know how thankful you are. Make sure you stay in communication. And then look down at verse 5. Paul expresses a gratitude to them for their participation in the gospel. Philippians 1.5, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. And we see here that the supporting churches in their prayers, in their gifts, in their encouragement, participate in the gospel. When a missionary goes out, he's not solo. He needs the church supporting him. And not just financially, but prayerfully and through encouragement. Uh, one missionary to the Middle East uh, said this, that the history of missions is the history of answered prayer. And he knew that to be true because it's difficult work on the mission field and he couldn't change one person's heart, but God could change people's heart. And he needed the prayers of the people uh, praying for him from his sending and supporting churches. We also see in Philippians in uh, verse 1-5, but also in 4-15, that Paul recognized his partnership was not only um, that he was a blessing to them, but they blessed him. It went both ways. Both his blessing of them and them blessing him. So, you know, I think missionaries and churches need to realize that they can uh, be an encouragement to their missionary, but also to learn from the missionary and grow from them. Paul in Philippians 1, 12 to 14, wasn't shy about his challenges with the church. Are you as a church ready to hear from your missionaries of the problems they're having on the field? Typically, in missionary newsletters, you want to tell about all the good things. You're telling about this person got saved, this many people. But the reality is, when you're out there, there are difficult times. There are conflicts. Uh, there are people who don't want to hear. There are divisions in churches overseas. And Paul wasn't afraid to share with them about those in a very real way. Because he knew that the church would receive that in the right spirit. And are we ready to receive that from our missionaries, or do we only want to hear the positive? But Paul didn't focus on the negative. He shared with them the challenges, but we see in uh, chapter 2, 17 to 18, he says, I urge you to rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. He talks about, yes, there's challenges, but I continue to rejoice. And he wanted them to know that uh, he trusted in God's sovereignty. And uh, he knew that the church rejoiced with him as he rejoiced. So we see here in Philippians, and we could look at other verses in Philippians, but there's a number of places where we see that the Philippian church was a godly supporting church. 
So as you read through the book of Philippians, put that lens on that, hey, they're talking, they're communicating with Paul, and you see it's a very personal letter, a lot of love being shown there. And that's the kind of relationship you need to have with your missionaries. Next, uh, missionaries should be cared for by supporting local churches. In this passage in 3 John, you're probably familiar with. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers, and they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. The standard at which we should care for missionaries as churches is a manner worthy of God. Well, that's a high call. I know there have been stories of missionaries even coming back to our church and statements like, oh, I have some secondhand stuff for the missionaries because you guys don't really appreciate new stuff. It's just not important to missionaries. Well, <laughs> actually, it's, we don't just like secondhand stuff. Um, I've heard stories of missionaries going to churches where they have the missionary closet. This closet in the church where people can give donations and the missionary can go pull something out of the closet. And a missionary telling me that the closet was opened and it was all the cast-offs, all the stuff that didn't sell at the garage sale is what it looked like. And the happy church staff member, go ahead, grab some things. And they're thinking, what do I grab out of this closet? Um, but just smiling and taking something. Is that caring for missionaries in a manner worthy of God? Um, we wouldn't treat our own family members, certainly not our close friends that way. Is this, is this how we want to take care of our missionaries that we've sent out to live in oftentimes very difficult situations? When I had been a missionary, I obviously didn't talk about these things because you, you're not supposed to. But now I'm on the other side of the fence. Now I am uh, one of the ones who could point the finger back at myself and say, hey, how am I caring for our missionaries? How is our church caring for our missionaries? And so I can share some of these stories that missionaries have told me over the years and relay them and let you know it's a missionary won't complain to you when they're treated poorly, at least not most of them, not the ones that I've known. But it, but it hurts. It hurts sometimes to, to be treated that way when you come back. And so um, I just want to encourage you, think about how you treat them. Now, I see that at the same time, that's probably 5% of the time. Probably 95% of the time, you know, they're very encouraged. And there's great stories that go along with that as well. And different people that they've uh, encountered and spent time with that they've been thrilled about. So not to say that it's always bad, but there have been, uh, there have been stories of, uh, of how it's happened. So these are some principles from Scripture, uh, some things that we see here. Now, what does that look like? What would that look like in your own church? And I can share a little bit what we do at our church um, and, and what it means, what, what it looks like to care for your missionaries. So putting it into practice here, the first thing and supporting your missionaries is you got to realize you need to shepherd your missionaries. You need to shepherd them. It's not enough uh, just to encourage them, but really to be shepherding them. And if you are the sending church of a missionary, you need to recognize that is your primary responsibility is to be shepherding that missionary when they go out on the field. It is not something you hand off to the sending organization. A sending organization can be super helpful, and they can help with a lot of administrative needs and even ministry strategy needs uh, with the sending church. But it doesn't relieve the sending church of caring for that missionary from their church. As an analogy, I send my son off to school. I sent him off to Master's University when I was still in China. It's not that I said, okay, I trust the professors. Now they have them. I don't need to care about my son anymore. Uh, they better do a good job and we'll see what happens in four years. 
No, I'm staying in touch with my son. I'm making sure he's doing okay. And if I need to talk to a professor over there, I will. But I am giving some trust to them, but I'm not releasing control. And I'm continuing to shepherd my son even when I send him away to college. And I think it's a good analogy for what you need to do with your missionaries. Yes, they may be connected to an agency, but you need to keep in touch to make sure they're doing well and shepherding them. Um, a lot of times what we do, so Grace Community Church, if we have TMS grads that go out through GMI, we have an agreement that we sign uh, with the sending church and the missionary and ourselves. So it's a three-way agreement. And that agreement spells out what each party is responsible for. And it clearly states there, the sending church, you are still shepherding that missionary. You are still responsible, and particularly for the areas of character and doctrine. And then as a sending agency, we'll be shepherding them on the ministry plan and what that looks like. So it's a coordinated approach between our different missionaries. But their character and doctrine, if there's an issue with that missionary, something happens, we'll go to that sending church and say, how's it going? Are you talking to him? Um, are you working with him? It's not something that we want sending churches to relinquish because that's not our responsibility as an organization. It's the church's responsibility. So those agreements can be helpful because you don't want to get to the point when or if an issue comes up with a missionary on the field, well, who's handling this? And a lot of times you figure, oh, well, someone else is handling it, but it never gets handled. An agreement helps make that clear in the beginning. Now to continue with that, shepherding of missionaries includes counseling care. You say, okay, so it is my responsibility to shepherd our missionaries. What does that look like? It looks like shepherding anybody else in your church. Uh, it looks like marriage counseling. It looks like parenting counseling. It looks like conflict resolution. It, all the things that you deal with, with an individual, on a counseling basis at your church, those are the same things you need to shepherd your missionaries with. Personal holiness. I know those who go out as missionaries, we think of, oh, they're, they gotta be faultless because they're willing to serve in this way. But it's not true, and they would tell you it's not true. They're still growing as well, and they need that. It's hard to get shepherding care when you're on the field. And that's for a number of reasons. Number one, you haven't built strong relationships with a lot of people. Uh, in the field at that point. Um, there's secondly not a lot of mature believers a lot of times in a lot of places where missionaries go. And so you're not getting that kind of feedback into your life. On the field, a lot of times people feel you're, you're the missionary, you're the answer man. And not the guy who's supposed to come to us with problems and so they just don't expect that. Uh, but if you as a sending church can continue to give that counsel to them, um, it will only help them and keep them from sin. So counseling care looks like any other church member counseling care. Next, visits. A good way to know what's going on in the life of your ministry, of your missionaries, to visit them. And if you ha that should be a regular thing. Maybe once every four years, five years, to get out there and see what it's like. Now, going to visit them, it's, there's costs associated with that, but it is well worth the investment. It is a great encouragement to the missionary when you come out there and visit them. Now, sometimes uh, when church leaders go out, they want to say, well, okay, well, what am I going to do when I go out there? What ministry am I going to have? And because they want to say, I preached at the missionary's church and go back and be able to tell everybody. Well, if that's helpful to the missionary's ministry, that's fantastic. If your missionary says, yeah, that would be a huge blessing to me if you could preach for a Sunday or two and I, I, don't, um, I could take that weekend off. But frankly, if they don't think it's helpful, then it's not your place to do that. Don't go thinking this is a ministry I'm going to accomplish as far as to the people in that country. You should go thinking, what is the ministry I can give to my missionary? How can I demonstrate love? How can I counsel, ask difficult questions? Um, again, it's not about what you can do when you go on a visit. 
but how you can love the missionary for their ongoing ministry in that country. But visits are a huge blessing. And sometimes uh, we forget that. I, uh, you know, as much as I've been involved in it, I, I forget it sometimes when I hear of a pastor going to visit a country and there's maybe more than one missionary in that country from our church. Well, if he sees one and not the other, it can really hurt the other person's feelings. Like, wow, you know, how come I'm not getting that? Because it just, it's special to have someone see what's going on in ministry. So visits are an important part of shepherding your missionaries. Next, fairly obvious, but letters, emails, and video chats um, is a great way of communicating with your missionary families. Having a regular pattern of communication with them. Sometimes uh, something as simple as responding to the newsletters when it comes in. At Grace Community Church, we have 92 missionary families, and it's difficult. We get newsletters constantly, obviously, from our missionaries. To respond to all those is very difficult. But it means so much to a missionary after they have spent time writing this newsletter from a pastor from others in the church, just a one sentence, two sentences sometimes. Read your newsletter, excited to hear about X, whatever it is. Or here's just one verse. I was encouraged by your newsletter. Here's the verse that has been encouraging me. Just something that shows I've read your newsletter and I care. And I prayed for you right now. Um, I think that can be a huge benefit to our missionaries is that response to newsletters. Because um, sometimes you don't know. How many people are reading this thing? Uh, you're on the other side of the world, you send it off, and you just wonder, what does this look like? One other thing on shepherding missionaries I want to mention is women counselors. Um, we have a program we started called Titus II International, or T2I. And we've done that because we have realized, um, although we were doing better at counseling our men and, and shepherding our men, uh, we weren't doing as good a job with the wives. And I, and I know why that's been. It's difficult for a pastor to call up the wife and say, hey, so how are you doing spiritually? Um, and so we didn't know how to handle that. We had to do a lot of thinking about that. Certainly husbands are the primary counselors of their wives, and we, we believe that. And missionary wives will be receiving counsel from their husbands. But there are times when they need counsel outside. I mean, we, we see that, don't we, in Titus 2, and that's why it's called Titus 2 International, women teaching women. There are various issues in women's life where women counselors are super helpful and the most beneficial thing. Um, ideally, also, there would be women in that country that would counsel the wife. Like when we were in China, well, how great it would be if we had strong other Christian women able to counsel my wife or encourage her. But reality is there's not a lot of mature believers in a lot of countries. And secondly, they feel very awkward ever confronting a, a missionary wife on something. So they'll, they'll back off. So to address this, we've created teams, groups, um, where we have either it's a former missionary who's in the States or one of our elders wives that meets with a few missionary wives over Skype on a regular basis. And that's a forum where they can share what's really on their hearts and the struggles they're facing. Because when a missionary wife's on the field, uh, she can't write in a newsletter, oh, by the way, we're having some marriage issues recently. Um, not something you usually want to put in a letter to your supporters. But to have a forum where they can go to an elder's wife and even to other missionary wives and say, hey, this is, this is a challenge and I'm, I'm needing to grow in this area, can you pray for me? And so we've connected groups, usually it's about four or five missionary wives with an elder's wife or former missionary, to have these phone calls and include with them a more veteran missionary wife as well. Um, so these, these have been very helpful, um, these types of relationships. But in general, I wanna remind you, don't forget about your missionary wives on the field. Don't think only about the husbands. Find a way to have women counsel the missionary wives in a non-threatening way. Um, again, it's hard for these wives to say things to family members or certainly to supporters 
hey, I want to let you know my sin issues. But to have an elder's wife at the sending church can be super helpful. So shepherding missionaries is a, is a huge way to be, to be faithful to them. Secondly, encouragement of missionaries. And I want to give you a few ways to practically think about that as well. Um, the first thing is, is publicity. Is letting your church know about the missionaries and what they are doing. Um, encouraging our missionaries is too big of a job for you, the pastoral staff, or even the missions committee to do on their own. It's something that the whole church needs to get involved in, in encouraging the missionaries. And you can help them in that by publicity, by letting people in your church know. You can do that by forwarding newsletters. Um, sometimes if there's a hard copy newsletter that can be posted at the church. Often these days it's digital newsletters. And if it's okay with the missionary, certainly check with them, forwarding that email to other people in the church. You of course need to be careful for those in classified areas and how that would be handled. But publicity is very important um, and we try and do that in a number of ways. At Grace Community Church we do that through, through forwarding emails and sharing with them. But we also have time where we put prayer requests from the missionaries and put them all in one document. And if it's a classified person or a classified country, we'll just put the person's initials or something like that as we pass out those prayer requests. But getting information out to the church is, is super important so that the whole church is caring for them. Uh, we put every Sunday morning, there's one of our missionaries' prayer requests are listed in our Sunday bulletin. That's just one more way to spark in your church members. Are we praying for missionaries? Just put prayer requests on the, in the Sunday bulletin, and that can be helpful uh, as well. So we've started creating, I think about 10 years ago, a calendar. We give out calendars free to our church members every year that have all our missionaries. And it talks about what they're doing, what country they're in. And so people have their calendar up on their wall, and there are the missionaries that they see every time they look at their calendar and are reminded to pray for them. So just one way to remind people to be praying. Another is STMs. STMs can greatly encourage missionaries and assist them if they request an STM. Um, I was STM coordinator at Grace Church for three years before heading to China and have heard many stories of how blessed some missionaries were by receiving STM teams that have come alongside them in gospel outreach and different ministries. Uh, but I have also heard stories of uh, guys that I knew in China, well, I have to take another STM team. My church said, we, I have to take one. And I got to host them and show them around Beijing. And it, it was a trial for them. It wasn't a blessing at all. It was a challenge. Like, great, an STM team. Uh, STM teams, short-term ministries teams, should be for the purpose of strengthening the long-term missionaries ministry. It is not primarily for the individuals going on the STM team. It is for the long-term missionary in country. Some STM teams have caused more trouble for the missionaries long-term ministry than have helped them. Um, just sometimes just being foolish, just not being wise and uh, offending Christians uh, in that country. So SDM teams though, if done right, if done with strong believers that are sent, it's not for their discipleship sending them an STM. These are people who have proven themselves faithful and they're going and doing the ministry that the missionary wants can be a huge blessing and an encouragement to the missionary. Next, having events at your church could be another way to promote missions. Different events, or regular events where you interview missionaries or talk about a missions topic. So we used to have a Tuesday night, one Tuesday night a month, where we would interview missionaries and pray for them. But we found out that it was very difficult for people to get down to our church on a Tuesday night because of traffic. So we've switched to quarterly events, quarterly Sunday afternoons. So now we're meeting on a Sunday afternoon and have a lunch, have pizza, or we'll have some sandwiches, and have a brief talk about missions and interview a couple missionaries. 
So this new uh, way we're doing this on Sundays is called Grace Global. Uh, had one a few weeks ago, had almost 300 people attending and praying for missionaries and hearing about them and how exciting that was uh, to have so many more people starting to engage in what's going on in missions. Another idea, something that we've done uh, for decades, something uh, called Mindset for Missions, and these are some ladies from our church. So in our ladies ministry, um, they meet every week for Bible study on Wednesday mornings, but then they've tacked on to that, let's have another time after Bible study to focus on missionaries. And every Wednesday, for an hour, there's a missionary who may be in town or through Skype that comes in and shares with this group of ladies. And it's been such a special thing for the missionaries over the years because these ladies, and you know, there's all ages, but a lot of older saints are just, just love our missionaries so much and have uh, knitted them quilts and all kinds of things just to encourage them. And so if there is a ladies ministry in your group, they can find practical things. I think, well, this year I know they've made aprons for our missionary wives. So they'll every year come up with a different gift to give our missionary wives. And uh, it's super encouraging. So if you have a women's ministry, think how you can utilize them uh, towards missions. Next on, as far as encouraging missions, missionaries, I wanna mention something we call PAC teams or prayer and care teams. <clears throat> the large events that I've been talking about, it can be super helpful. And I think you need to have large events to try and draw in as many people as possible. But what's also good is to have ownership, have different groups that have ownership of a missionary. So what we have done, we've taken all of our missionary families sent by Grace Church, and we've taken every Bible study at church and assigned them a missionary or connected them with a missionary. So now each Bible study has one missionary that they're, that's the one that is theirs and they need to care for them. And I tell you, breaking it down in that way has been super beneficial because it's sometimes overwhelming. Say your church has 10, 15, 20 missionaries. I don't know who to care for. I, it's just too much to handle. But if a certain Bible study says, oh, well, this is our missionary, they could focus on that, read the newsletters in that Bible study and truly develop a relationship with that missionary family. So I, I encourage you to, to consider this, consider these prayer and care teams uh, with the Bible studies. In addition to the regular updates in these prayer and care teams, one of the major things we have these teams do is furlough care. And so that's the next thing I wanna mention is, is furlough care by, by these prayer and care teams. So when a missionary is coming into town, we have them let us know, and then I let the key person know in that Bible study we have a missionary coming in town, so they have some responsibilities when that missionary comes. If we tried to handle these responsibilities as outreach staff, we'd never be able to do it because we have people coming and going all the time. And that's probably how you are if you're on church staff. You can't do all these things, but you can delegate this. Give it to people who love the missionaries and are just looking for how do I implement this? So we let them know, here are things you need to do when a missionary comes to town. Find out if they need a ride from the airport. Look at airport pickup, see if that's needed. Um, first Sunday, there's first Sunday care. When they first arrive on campus, someone from your Bible study, greet them when they arrive. Be ready for them. You know they're coming, you be ready. You save them a seat in the church or in a fellowship group. You save them a seat if they have, you have snacks at the church, get snacks for the missionary. If there's child care, if the missionary has children, you help them register or whatever it takes to get children checked in to the nursery or childcare. But someone who is there caring for the missionary when they come on campus. And again, to have one person try and do this for all the missionaries in your group, in your church, would be too difficult. Split this up. Have each Bible study have a missionary and they can provide this kind of care. Other ideas, um, obviously drop off back at the airport when they leave. Schedule a time for the missionary to share at the Bible study when they're in town. I tell you, one big uh, thing is if you can provide babysitting for the missionary when they're in town. 
oftentimes missionaries, when they're on the field, they can't go on a date, just the two of them, because there's no one to watch the kids. Um, some countries, it's just unheard of. In China, you don't have friends watch your kids. You just don't do that. Uh, but when they, missionaries come in town to say, oh, I can just have a date night with my wife, is something that's super refreshing. So consider that doing that for missionaries when they're in town. Um, obviously, welcome baskets, taking them out to lunch or dinner, uh, doing outings with the missionary family. Um, all these things are very encouraging when they come. Uh, and then vehicles or housing, a lot of times these are needs the missionaries have when they're on furlough as well. So something to consider. I'm sure that's something um, you've probably thought of in the past, but didn't want to leave that out. One more area I just want to touch on briefly um, is, is family care. That's the last one there. There's a couple things on family care that you may not have thought about, but certainly I've heard a lot from missionaries on. Uh, one is kids transitioning. So you're on the field and your kid comes back to go to university. It's difficult. That's one thing missionaries have told me is one of the hardest things they do is saying goodbye to their kids, sending them back to the States for school. Well, if they have a church, if they have individuals back in the States, that's a resource for their kids. It's super comforting for the parents. Be that resource. Be that resource for your missionary families. Um, there are simple things you can't do on the missions field many times. Learning how to drive a car. You just don't have that opportunity. But you can provide that. Teach missionary kids how to drive. I've taught a couple missionary kids how to drive. Uh, one who was staying with us um, was from South Africa. And it was interesting because he started going right to the left side of the road. <laughs> and no, 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 in America here. Right side, right side. Uh, <laughs> It can be quite entertaining, but I survived them all. Um, but think about that, how to use a bank, how to write a check. Uh, simple things that you can teach missionary kids when they transition back to the States, um, that their parents wish they could be there for them, uh, but they can't because they're on the mission field. Be that resource for them. And then finally, elder parent care. Another difficult part of being a missionary is having parents who are needing more and more care as they get older. And as a missionary, you don't know, what, what does that mean for me? Do I come home off the field? How do I handle this? Be a resource to these missionary families. Come alongside them in figuring out elder care. It may be checking in every so often. Um, it may be getting groceries. Um, it could look like a lot of things. And there may be a time when a missionary has to come off the field uh, because it's of such a uh, nature that they need to come and care for their own parents. But between the gaps, you can help in that way. And that would be a, a huge blessing to them. So these are just some examples, some ideas on that. Um, you know, again, Paul praised the Philippians for their work, their participation in his ministry. The sending and supporting churches, he saw them as real partners. And that's what we need to be as well real partners to our missionaries and participating in the ministry that they're doing overseas. And I, I think that's our heart. It's just a matter of making the effort to do that and doing these things. So do you have any questions that I can answer for you or different ideas? I know we're just about out of time. All right, well, I'll make myself available. Uh, let me... Uh, pray for us real quick. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you um, that we can participate in the gospel ministry of our missionaries. Father, may you make us faithful to do that. Lord, that we would work hard in the work of the ministry just as our missionaries are as well. And we do that to your praise and glory. Amen.